Let's stand on our feet. Let's worship him. I was buried beneath my shame. Thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us. And we are so grateful for this time that we are able to come together as a family and just worship you. And Lord, I pray that someday soon, that we all can be back together again as a congregation and just fellowship and, and just praise your name together. Lord, I also pray that you put your healing hand on this nation we are in such times of uncertainty right now and lord i just ask that you give us comfort and strength to deal with what's going on right now and lord i pray that 
no matter what it is that we all know and we keep the faith that you are you are constantly in control you are in control of this situation and we really have no reason to be worried lord i ask today that if there's anybody that's hurting or anybody that has a need anybody that doesn't know you that our music and our words today will touch somebody and they, and we will be a blessing to them Lord, we love you and we praise you. In your precious name we pray, amen. Well, welcome everybody this morning. All right. I know you're alive because I heard you singing and clapping during that song. So don't try to pretend like you're not full of energy or perhaps the spirit this morning. Hope everybody has had a great week or had a great week rather. Uh, we're thrilled that, that you're all here this morning, those of you that, that could attend. And also we want to say welcome to those at home online while uh, watching. Um, it, it's really great that we can present God's word and reach people as they're able to comfortably and safely both sit at home and view online. So we praise God for that blessing. In that same vein, though, we do hope, um, and hopefully soon, uh, that we can all come back together in this place, uh, united as a body to worship our great and wonderful God. So today we're going to continue uh, with our Dear Church series. And so this series uh, has been going on for several, several weeks. We've bounced in and out of it over the course of a couple different days like Father's Day, or I'm sorry, on Mother's Day. No, I was wrong. Father's Day. I was right the first time. Uh, as well as a guest speaker and so on. And so, uh, and then and Pastor Jeremy came up and spoke one week um, celebrating a milestone in his, in his ministry. And so uh, we are back in this series and we're going to actually close it out finally next week. We're going to actually get to the end of this this series one day. Um, but it's just a great series, this Dear Church series. And I do have to say, as I, as I kind of reflected um, this past week on the, the previous weeks of this series, and, and not only that, but also reading through 1 Corinthians, um, where Paul is writing uh, this, this letter to the people uh, in Corinth, as we've covered over the past weeks, um, how, just how relevant this book, this New Testament book, how relevant it is in today's world. You know, it's, it's almost like, and I know many of you have commented on this as well, it's almost like uh, God's word is alive and he has a plan for his people. Can we get an amen? amen. Yeah. And it's also almost like this plan uh, or this purpose, rather, has no expiration date either, which is quite unique. And what's interesting is that we, uh, when I say we, I'm referring to us believers, uh, we seem to have some habits that some you know, 2,000 years later, as we reflect on, these, on this, this book of, to first, that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, um, that, that we, can't, we can't seem to shake. Some habits that still seem to reside in us. Habits that continue to both divide our world and, unfortunately, divide our churches in some cases. And this habit is a habit called sin. You may be familiar with it. Well, Paul continues, as we will read this morning, to address these questions uh, that the Corinthians have kind of put before him. They've come to him with all these questions, um, and, and this, uh, the dilemma or the, the uncertainty, if you will, that exists uh, here in, this, in the chapters we're going to get into today, that exists in Corinth, um, is, is kind of wrapped up in the question of, um, like, who, who is the best, or, or perhaps maybe who's the most important uh, more specifically, which spiritual gift is the most important or has the most value? And so if you haven't heard it or if you haven't seen it in this study that we've been working through in 1 Corinthians, uh, or maybe you've traveled through that book on your own in your own time, but the, 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 the people of, of Corinth, the believers in Corinth, uh, they seem to look for just about any reason to squabble. I don't know why I chose that word squabble, but it just sounds really weird. But they, they look for about any reason to disagree or to, to argue or to bicker or whatever word you want to put in there. And they seem to be more divided on different issues than they are united. 
And the irony, I think, is that they continue to refer to themselves or call themselves the church. And so Paul, he offers some real practical wisdom here to the Corinthians. And so we're going to begin in, in chapter 12 uh, of the book of New Testament book of 1 Corinthians. So it's toward the back of your paper Bible. Uh, if you would follow along with us, uh, but we will have the, the uh, passages here on the screen. Uh, if you have the Bible app, you can actually follow along with a digital bulletin, whether you're here in-house or watching at home online. There's a digital bulletin there where you can read through these different passages as well as take notes and maybe save you a little time on the note-taking part if you use that platform, if you so choose. But let's go ahead and jump into it. Let's, let's read it together. So uh, chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, it reads this. Now, dear brothers and sisters, regarding your question about spiritual abilities the Spirit gives us, I don't want you to misunderstand this. You know that when you were still, when we, I'm sorry, when you were still pagans, you were led astray and swept along and worshiping speechless idols. So I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God, hear that, Spirit of God, will curse Jesus. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by, say it with me, the Holy Spirit. Yes, the Holy Spirit. So Paul, he kind of begins this correction by first reminding the Corinthians, or the people of Corinth, if you will, where they came from, what they used to be like, what history may be revealed in them. The most important aspect of this introduction, uh, these introduction uh, verses here in chapter 12, uh, is the emphasis that Paul places on the power, say it with me, of the Holy Spirit. Essentially saying this in shorthand, um, that the Holy Spirit, by which uh, you you and I are able to confess that Jesus is Lord, uh, Paul understands and, and he's trying to, to kind of teach or maybe even say remind those listening that the Spirit of God is what gives us and the, the people of, of Corinth uh, the power to overcome our sin. And the Spirit is what leads and guides us, especially when it comes to implementing or practicing our spiritual gifts that are given by God. So no matter what or which ability uh, was given uh, to you or to me or whomever by the grace of God to further the gospel message, right, it is useless without the presence of the Holy Spirit. And as believers, we should be filled with the Spirit. The Spirit is what makes us like Christ. I couldn't help but to feel the Spirit in the room as we were worshiping just a little bit ago. If you're a note taker, write this down. Your first, first um, thought for today is this, spirit filled. Think of being spirit filled. And we're going to continue reading here in verses 4, 5, and 6 here in just a moment. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, which, which we know that, right? But the same spirit is the source of them all. The same spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we all serve the same Lord, there's some really important words here throughout these verses. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. The same spirit and the same God that does the work in all of us. So if we were to continue reading um, just past, um, excuse me, past verse 6, we would see the, the, um, some more explanation that that God, um, or see the explanation rather, that God in his, his wisdom, right, in his perfection gives each of us different, and although there may be some similarities throughout them, uh, different spiritual gifts. Uh, but even though uh, we all have different spiritual gifts, as noted, uh, that have been granted by God, we are ultimately united by the fact that we each serve the same God with these many, many different gifts. So it's kind of interesting and unique, I think, and a good reminder so Paul reminds the Corinthians that God alone, and in verse 11, he says, you know, decides which gift each person would receive, which spiritual gift that they would receive. And if we think about kind of the perfection, right, of God, right, and we know that God is perfect, and we remind ourselves uh, what, what, he, what, uh, what we read in the, the earlier chapters of 1 Corinthians, that God's wisdom is, is beyond and above and outside of this, this worldly wisdom that we possess, right? We covered that in earlier weeks. That we should, I, I hope, and, and same, same truth is for me, that I, that I hope that I would find comfort and you would find comfort in knowing that God does not make mistakes. He is perfect. 
So one of the things that my mind's kind of like drawn to, if you will, when I think about um, you know, how each person is kind of strategically given um, spiritual gifts by God is, is the importance uh, of, of them all. How each one is so important and so perfectly and specifically placed in each of us. And what makes them important, I believe, is this, is that their purpose, that they're purpose-filled, that, that, they're, that they're given by God with purpose and a plan. And as a community of believers, there's this beautiful thing that when we become together as believers and we work together for the same purpose, amazing things can happen through the power of God. So I want you to write this down if you're a note taker, different, the, the, the next slide. Different gifts, same spirit, the Holy Spirit. Spirit, different gifts, same spirit. Or maybe an easier way to say that would be, and we had this note earlier in the chapter, same God. Different gifts, same God, right? So Paul continues in verse 12 here. We're going to look at verses 12, uh, 13, and 14. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. But we all have been baptized into one body, one body of believers by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit, the Holy Spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. I think we know that, right? If we think about the body, the human body, how we have multiple parts and how it, how it works and flows and functions and in, in good or, or in different ways. But what, what, once, once we kind of make this crossover, right, once we kind of confess that, that, that Jesus is the Lord through the power of the Holy Spirit, and we kind of take this, this step of obedience uh, that, that looks like baptism into this new life and relationship with Jesus, then we become, as Paul kind of uh, identified there, part of the body of believers, a body that's made up of different, many different parts, many different gifts, Many different colors, many different personalities, many different things that make one body. You kind of hear what I'm saying this morning? Do you have any sports fans in the room? Let me see. Sports fans? Yeah? All right. So on the count of three, I want you to yell out your favorite sport. Okay? Maybe it's your favorite sport to watch or play or used to play, whatever. But on the count of three, I want to hear, let them at home hear you yell out your favorite sport. Ready? On three. Ready? One, two, three. Oh, I heard a lot. Okay, I heard, I heard some footballs. Who's a football fan? Fo okay, all right, C come, come stand right down here for me, would you, football fan? Now, this football is a little flat because I thought maybe, you know, you, you can be a fan of football and not be a great catch. So give me just a little bit of, a little bit of space here, okay? And I, and I won't throw it hard. I'm not that great of an aim. So bear, bear with me. If I miss you entirely, just, just bear with me. Okay, ready? So, all right. You see what happened there, right? You saw what happened? All right, throw it back. Thank you, man. Thank you, I appreciate it. See what happened? I threw the football, and what did he do, thankfully? He caught it, right? Because if he would have dropped it, it would have ruined the whole illustration, I think. So, right, can, can you imagine real quick, thinking about football, can you imagine if you turned on, like, college or NFL football, right? And on the screen of your TV, there are 11 quarterbacks on one side of the field. There's just 11 guys standing there holding the ball, right? Like, it, it would seem a little confusing, right? you got 11 quarterbacks on one side, and then on the other side, you have players in their correct positions. And I'm not a football whiz, but there's a lot, right? Defensive line, linebackers, safeties, et cetera. And the list goes on. And I think we know this about quarterbacks, right? We know that quarterbacks can throw the ball, generally, or they don't last that long if they can't throw the ball well, right? So the quarterbacks throw the ball. They aren't, most of the time, except for my man Tim Tebow, they aren't really known for running the ball down the field in most cases, at least in the NFL, right? Did, did any of you have the pleasure of watching Peyton Manning in his, in his heyday, right? Okay, yeah. Okay, so you know that quarterbacks are not made to run the ball, at least not good ones, right? He, he would like run and he would do like this, this like tippy-toe dance over hot coal as he would try to run down the field. It was very, very awkward, right? Peyton's obviously the the best to do it on, the, NFL, on the, the football field. But he was not a runner, right? He wasn't made to do that. He was made to throw the ball. So if we have 11 quarterbacks on our team, we're likely never going to see the end zone. And the end zone for you non-football fans is where they go to score the touchdown, right? That's a zero score at the end of the game, right? We're not making it to the end zone with 11 quarterbacks. It's just not going to happen. And not only are we, are we not moving the ball forward, are we not advancing down the field of play, but every time the opponent hits us, it's a crippling blow with no protection. 
because we're not in the correct positions. The quarterback has no one to pass the ball to, as you saw earlier, right? He just, what good is that? What's that? There's no one there. There's no one to to advance the ball. There's no one there working together. There's no cohesiveness to advance down the field of play. And then largely because he's not going to throw it to another quarterback. He's likely going to fumble the ball. Do you hear what I'm saying? The quarterback is important. Don't get me wrong. The quarterback is important, but not without everybody else. The ball doesn't move down the field. Let me ask you this question and go ahead and put it on the screen. What is, what is your gift? Think about that today. Think about that this week. Pray about that more importantly. What's your gift? What gift has God given you? What do you perceive as, as your spiritual gifts? Are you a quarterback? Are you a lineman? Are you a safety? Paul, he kind of describes it this way in verses 15 through 18. Go ahead and put them up on the screen. If the foot says, I am not a part of the body because I am not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I'm not part of the body because I am not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? No, the answer is no. If the whole body were an eye, how would it hear? Or if the whole body were an ear, how would it smell anything? Some of you have teenage kids like I do, wouldn't mind not smelling anything. But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. Each part is just where he wants it. Can you imagine getting dressed in the morning and you put your pants over your head because your legs are attached to your shoulders? That just sounds ridiculous, doesn't it, to even say? It's not an accident that God created our bodies the way that he did so that each part could function according to its purpose, even in brokenness. And that is how we as believers are molded together as a body of believers, the church, to work together to compensate for each other's weaknesses, and to build on each other's strengths. We can't progress down the field of play, or rather the field of faith, without each other. Because that is how we are built. We need one another. Like the eye needs the head, and the feet need the legs. We need one another. We need each other. Paul closes this uh, section or this chapter, with he, he lists out some different roles we're going to look at here in a second uh, within the body of believers. And so verses 27 um, and, and 28, if you'd follow along with me. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. Here are some of the parts God has appointed for the church. So here he's talking to positions in the church, if you will, or in the, in the body of believers. First, our apostles. Second, our prophets. Third, our teachers. Then those who do miracles, those who have the gift of healing, those who can help others, those who have the gift of leadership, and those who speak in unknown languages or speaking in tongues, if you will. I wonder if when you just read this list, maybe for the first time, and maybe you need to go back and look at it again, I wonder if you thought to yourself, like I did to myself as I kind of reread it this week, that I would have maybe listed things a little differently. Yeah, anybody agree with that? Yeah, maybe I would have had a little different order there. I don't know. That's just the humanity in me, I think. But um, I would have maybe shaken it up a little bit. I would have maybe even had miracles like at the top. You guys might remember we did a a study over the book of Acts. I think it was last year and uh, talked about miracles, right? And, And you might be thinking like after all miracles and kind of the way I was thinking is miracles are like this big flashy cool thing, right? That like create a draw and they create some wow and some pizzazz, right? They have that wow factor. But Paul says no. First, first be an apostle. First be someone on a mission. Be a messenger of God first. See, this whole analogy about the body and the list of the important pieces or or, or positions, if you will, they all came about because the Corinthians were so impressed, probably not unlike we are today, were so impressed with themselves, specifically for them, about their ability to speak in tongues, right? 
they held this like really high uh, value on the ability to, to have this or do this one particular spiritual gift. And Paul spends these couple chapters correcting this mindset or correcting this behavior, if you will. And he says, listen, you know, none of these gifts, including speaking in tongues, Corinthians, are possible without the Holy Spirit. Say it, Holy Spirit. None of them are possible without the Holy Spirit. As important as these things are or as they may be, these spiritual gifts, something else is bigger. Then he begins to kind of create this shift in dialogue or this this move in dialogue about the most important attribute of being a believer. Now, I don't know how much you know about Paul, but Paul is a pretty clever, pretty crafty guy with his words and the way that he goes about delivering in these letters and in his dialogue. You know, like when a comedian uh, tells a joke, right? Like if, they, if, if the punchline, um, the punchline when they, when they tell the joke, it's only really effective if the setup is good. You know what I'm saying? You heard a funny joke, and if the, if the, if the setup is poor, then the punchline kind of is like, eh, that's funny, but it could have been better if you had worked a little bit on the, on the setup, right? So you got to set it up before you deliver the punchline. And so Paul, he kind of set up here the punchline that's going to come in a minute, all of it to set up not just a punchline, but the most important thing. He basically kind of walks through this entire analogy, right, to get to one place in his correction. And often, I want you to think about that, often as, as believers or as, as, as uh, trying to share our faith and witnessing to others and, and what have you in our lifestyle, often think about sometimes here's the, here's the golden nugget, right, here's the, here's the ticket, but sometimes i got to set it up. Does that make sense? Got to work to that. So let's continue reading here. We're going to jump into chapter 13 now and read verses 1 and 2. Paul says this, If I could speak all the language of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be, say it with me, nothing. nothing. I'd be nothing. We'd be nothing. You'd be nothing. He continues with other examples kind of in this same vein, ultimately saying that that all we do will account for nothing if it's not done in love. And this is not a superficial worldly love that you might see plastered all over the place with no real depth to it. It's like, oh, I love all of you guys. You hear kind of celebrities say, oh, I love everybody. I love you all. And it's, you know, you, we don't know these people that we, that we supposedly love. But it's not this kind of up here love, right? But it's this love that's rooted in our faith in Jesus. It's a real love. So I want you to write this down. Next note. Gifts of love. Think of it like this. Spiritual gifts are rooted in love or rooted in Jesus. Gifts of love. Our spiritual gifts should be used in a manner to love, or a manner of love, rather, to build up other people and point them to Jesus. I love saying that. Point them to Jesus. Say it with me. Point them to Jesus. If our gifts are used void of the love of Jesus, then they're no good. They're not for the good of others. They're relatively rendered useless for the kingdom of God. The best and most simplified way to explain this love that Paul is is kind of making a reference to here in, in chapter 13 is to say that love, Christian love, is the willingness to give up our own desire for the good of others. Or maybe give up the resistance to certain things. To love others. Our gifts that, that God has, has granted to us are temporary to this life. But love lasts forever because God is love and God is timeless. Paul goes on explaining what love is and, and what love isn't, right? 
I always love to know when something, what, when something is defined as something, what, else, what is it defined not as? You know, what's the opposite of that so I can really build a contrast? And so um, in verse 4, um, if, you've, if you've ever attended a wedding, you've probably heard these words before and maybe not even realized it. You're probably more familiar with them than you know. And, and it goes like this in verse 4. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way, it is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. And although I don't think weddings are the exact context that this passages were written in, if we're being fair, it does work in that setting. So maybe many of you have heard that. And and speaking of weddings, I I, I want to add this morning, um, just so I don't get in trouble, but I just celebrated my 11th wedding anniversary on Friday with my wife Molly. Thank you. I know you're clapping because she put up with me for 11 years. I get it. I get it. But but throughout these, you know, 11 plus years, um, including the time we dated and all of that, I've learned a lot about love over this decade or so. And I've learned, um, and still learning, not just how to love my wife, but also how to love my three children as well. And it's still something that that I'm working on uh, and figuring out. And if I'm honest, it's not always easy to love others or at least express that love right. Not at all. It's not always easy. Love has its ups and downs. There's, There's no doubt about that. Uh, One of the biggest obstacles for me personally uh, is that, and it was kind of largely unexpected as well, is how to allow myself to be loved. How to allow that to happen. Seems kind of odd, and it was even odd as I was thinking about it and writing about it some, but when we think about um, love, uh, loving others, or even expressing our love to others, we're often, and I'm often, sidelined by the fact that our love is somewhat disingenuous due to the fact that we don't truly love ourselves or more importantly, accept God's love for us. Often we see the brokenness about ourselves come out in the way we express our love to others. Did you hear that? The brokenness in ourselves comes out in the way that we express love to other people. Our spiritual gifts even are hindered by this same brokenness. But the beautiful truth is that God created us and gifted us each beautifully and differently And he did it all in his image, that we may learn to love the way that he first loved us. Our mission as a church, some of you are wearing the shirt today, I saw it on a couple of you, go love, the action step to a life lived first loving the Lord and made possible through the power of the Holy Spirit. What a recipe. Loving others because we were first loved. Love being the true mark of one who follows Jesus. Verse 11 here, chapter 13, verse 11, we're going to speed up here. I'm taking a little longer than I anticipated, I'm sorry. When I was a child, Paul writes, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child, but when I grew up, I put away childish things. Maybe we should read that again. I know some of you ladies out there are writing this down. 1 Corinthians 13, 11. <laughs> Next time my husband sits down at the Xbox, boom, 1 Corinthians 13, 11. You want to go play basketball with your friends at your age? 1 Corinthians 13, 11, right? No, I'm just kidding. All right, let's move on here. Um, verse, verse 12, we'll go ahead and put it on the screen. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. There's a now and then contrast here. Right now, today, things seem imperfect during this time frame. It's also worth noting that, that a mirror back in this time frame that Paul is kind of writing about, he's talking about uh, the, these mirrors, not, not like a mirror that you have at home in your bathroom or in the bathrooms here, but mirrors were made of this polished bronze uh, material. So when you looked at your reflection in the mirror, it seemed very distorted and very imperfect as he's writing this. That's his reference. So what is seen in that reflection is imperfect. Clarity is low. Anybody have a smart TV? It's the difference between 720 and and, and 4K. Big difference. Went to a friend's house with 4K. I didn't know celebrities had freckles. It's crazy clarity. But the point is that when we look at ourselves or even other people, it's messy. 
We don't see with perfect clarity. Everything is partial or incomplete. But then one day, everything will be complete. All of these spiritual gifts, these talents, and for some of you, your good looks and your high intelligence will fade off like the evening sun. And the same God that knows you completely now will take all that's impartial and incomplete and make it whole again. We'll close out chapter 13 with this last verse. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is, say it with me, love. The greatest is love. You know when you're typing on your computer, maybe in Microsoft Word, and you're writing something, and that little blinking thing comes up on the screen? A little blinker. Does anybody know what that's called? My initial thought was that it was just a cursor, right? But after I got to verse 13, and I read it over and over and over, I kind of got stuck on it. And I read it again in the context of the message, and I started to stare at that little cursor, that little blinker thing, for so long that I I was led to Google to figure out what exactly is this thing called. That's how long I stared at the screen. And if you Google it, you'll find out that that little blinker is commonly referred to as the insertion point, which is the point where you would add more text or to a page or paragraph or something like that. This insertion point held me captive for longer than I'd care to admit as I was stuck on verse 13. And the greatest of these is love. What more do I need to say, I thought to myself. I've really nothing left to insert. You know, often when I read through various chapters and and, and verses, and I know it's my job to present them to you and try to potentially offer some kind of explanation of the text and the way that it was written or the context. And sometimes when I think about that, it grieves me to think that we're not getting into this text on our own and reading, putting that love into action by first learning and reading about a real, true, and unwavering love from our God. Colossians 3.14 says it this way, above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds us together in perfect harmony. Dear church, our talents, although helpful, often divide us more than they unite us because they are done void of God's love. And let's remember today and forevermore that the love that comes through the Holy Spirit of God truly unites us. Keep the faith, rest in hope, and thrive in his love. Let's pray. God, thank you for your love. Thank you for the way that you bring us together and the recipe that you've developed to do this, God. The, the way that, that you've perfectly placed us together in our, in our bodies, but also as a body of believers, as this church, as the church out in the world, as the collective kingdom. We're so thankful for that, God. God, I pray that, that your son, that your spirit, your spirit continues to work in our lives. Lord, Lord, we're so thankful for your son who gave his life for us so that all this is possible. And God, as the spirit, as the Holy Spirit moves in us, in our lives, God, I pray that we are able to do great things because of you and because of your spirit. It's in Jesus' name, amen. If you want... To spend some time today in prayer, uh, I'm going to make myself available in the fireside room just out the doors to the right. If you're at home, give us a call. Someone's available on the phone to pray with you, to take any decisions maybe that you've made today. But please move your feet as God prompts you. I stand I believe in the sun I believe in the risen one I believe I overcome by the power of his blood
Bluff Creek. Um, if you don't mind, good morning. If you don't mind having to see, I have a few announcements. But the first thing I'm going to do, the kids that are in the auditorium, they're going to know this. The kids at home, get ready, because um, you guys are going to know it too. So I'm going to say God is good. You're going to say all the time. I'm going to say all the time, and you're going to respond with God is good. Are you guys ready? God is good. All the time. All the time. Awesome, awesome, because God is great. We love him so much. Um, so we're going to ask you that you still stay in your seats, that the ushers will come, and they will dismiss you one at a time. Um, we have a special today on Facebook. It's going to be at 2 o'clock. It's going to be live. We are going to have a prayer for back to school, because schools are trying to right now figure out what they're going to do in there's situations of when to start and all that stuff. So this is this going to be a time that we can have prayer and be able to discuss some worries and concerns that parents or teachers might have right now. Um, let's see. Communion. If you did not receive your communion in your row, just let your usher know, and they will make sure you get one. We also have our giving baskets in the back and then you can also do it as well as online you can also use the um, church center app as well and you can text 84321 also we have lots of options we hope you all have a fantastic week and that we get to see you here again next week goodbye <laughs>